want to thank you for joining us today for this discussion. We're excited to have you here during National Inventors Month as we learn about an inventor's journey to the Hall of Fame. Before we start the discussion, I have a few housekeeping notes to go over. If for any reason you get disconnected, you can log back into the program at any time via the WebEx link that brought you here. If you miss any portion of today's program, don't worry, we will be recording today's program to post on our webpage in the next few weeks at www.uspto.gov. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our moderator for today's program, Drew Hirschfield, performing the functions and duties of the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and the Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Drew, thank you for moderating today's panel. It's my pleasure, Sean, and thank you for the great introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is going to be a wonderful, lively conversation with Dr. Fran Ligler. I'm very excited about this. Today's event is part of the USPTO's mission to promote innovation in the United States and throughout the world. Our discussion today with Dr. Ligler, Ligler was organized by our Office of Innovation Outreach. Thank you to all of the staff uh, that that office uh, has has worked on all of this. Uh, thank you for helping independent inventors and startups and universities and underrepresented groups and underserved populations for all the work that you do. So a big thank you goes to, to all of you. As Sean mentioned, this broadcast with Dr. Ligler will be saved on the USPTO website. We encourage you to direct your friends, your families, your colleagues, and all students to the website for them to witness the incredible life story and achievements of our guest today. I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Fran Ligler for many years. So let me start by saying from here forward, I'm gonna call her Fran, because that's the way I know her. Um, she's a true champion of the American system of invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And she's a marvelous person who I've really enjoyed getting to know over the last few years. We cannot ask for a better spokesperson for the advancement of innovation in the United States and around the world. And I could spend the remainder of this hour describing Fran's achievements so I'm only going to mention some. For starters, she's one of the nation's leading experts in the scientific fields associated with biosensors, biomaterials, biochemistry, and bioengineering. She's cur currently the Ross Lamp Distinguished Professor in the Joint Department of Biomedical Engineering at North Carolina State University and School of Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She holds more than 30 patents and was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2017 for the development of portable optical biosensors. By the way, I was fortunate enough to be the person who was able to give Fran her medal when she was inducted to the Hall of Fame. Uh, so it's a personal uh, great achievement that I was able to have. Uh, she's a native of Louisville, Kentucky and grew up training horses on her grandfather's farm. Fran, from all of us at the USPTO and for all of your fans, uh, welcome and thank you so much for doing this. Drew, thank you very much. Uh, it's a tall order to follow that introduction, <laughs> but I'm here and I hope we'll have a good time and looking forward to this discussion. I'm sure we will. Let's start with your technology that you've been involved in getting patents and, and inventions on. Um, why don't we just, if you don't mind, can you just give people a background, those who don't know what biosensors, et cetera, are, it would be real helpful to just have some background into what you've been working on over the years and what you have indu were inducted to the Hall of Fame for. So a biosensor is a very sensitive way to detect a target that you care about. And it uses the same kind of molecules to do detection that your body does um, to fight off disease, antibodies, DNA, You've heard a lot about that DNA recognition and antibody recognition in the last year. We take those kinds of molecules and put them into a sensor, in my case, an optical sensor. So when that very highly sensitive, specific, powerful recognition molecule binds its target, you get a, it lights up, the complex lights up and you get a signal that you can measure with a small system. So my contribution started with how do you um, attach those molecules into a piece of hardware to do the recognition? And then how do you build small integrated optical sensor systems around the molecules to do the readout? And most recently uh, in the last few months, I've been awarded a patent on a 
programmable pump made out of paper that you can use to pull the fluids through those kinds of sensors. So everything from the beginning of the biomolecule and keeping it functional while it's attached to pulling the sample through the systems and integrating all the hardware into a small portable device is what I've been working on for many years. That's great and wonderful to see that you are you're still still patenting and still moving forward uh, with with all those in, innovations. By the way, uh, for those of you that aren't very familiar with the National Inventors Hall of Fame, um, there are about 600 inductees. Now, as most of you know, we just passed the 11 the milestone of 11 million patents. So put that into perspective: 11 million patents, all those innovators, and you're talking about 600 people or so in the, in the National Vendors Hall of Fame, uh, quite remarkable. Um, Fran, can you, uh, uh, in, in layman's terms, just so we make sure uh, people like me understand, what exactly are the type of things you're, you're sensing with these biosensors? Um, they are quite varied. Um, I started out working for the Navy building sensors for biological warfare agents. Uh, the same technology uh, we developed for doing explosives, for uh, trying to detect explosives being smuggled onto airplanes. Uh, we developed sensors for drugs of abuse uh, in saliva and urine. We de developed sensors for environmental pollutants in soil and groundwater. And um, for uh, toxins and, and poisons going through the post office system. So basically, any it's uh, looking, in my case, it was looking for anything that could kill you. And my initials are FSL, so I was always kidded that that stands for find something lethal. <laughs> uh, but the ones I'm most proud of have been commercialized for detection of infectious diseases. And they have been used um, very widely internationally and saved quite a few lives. So I'm very happy about that. Yeah, that, that, that is wonderful. You actually read my mind because I was going to, going to ask you, uh, what, what were you most proud of? But, but, but thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I, will, I will also say that, that, first of all, I didn't recognize the breadth of, of uh, how the invention is used. It's absolutely wonderful. And I'll confess to, to over the years of have actually having looked up to see if I was the examiner on any of the patents that you issued, which I wasn't. <laughs> Um, but I was actually in, in this type of technology as an examiner a little bit or close to it. So, so I thought that that was pretty neat. Um, I'd like to talk about um, if we can change gears a little bit to what brought you um, to this field. And, and most particularly, how did you get involved in, in innovation and, and wanting to be an innovator? I have always looked for creative problems to uh, creative ways to solve problems since I was very small. But if we define innovator as uh, creative problem solving that leads to a patentable invention, I would say mostly after I came to the Naval Research Lab, I had considered patenting one of my inventions while I worked for DuPont, but there wasn't really a very good business reason for doing that. When I came to the Naval Research Lab, it became very clear that if the work that my teams were, the, the projects they were pursuing were going to lead to devices that we could put in the hands of the user to help them out, we had to patent the invention and license it to a company that, that would then make the invention. The other thing that was also um, really important was that we showed multiple applications for each invention uh, because quite frankly, the DOD can be a bit of a flaky uh, customer. So we wanted to make sure that there was a civilian customer for all of the devices we were making. So we showed that it could be used to solve everyday problems as well as military ones. And the patent was absolutely essential to get the work for out of the lab and into the hands of the user through uh, commercialization. So it wasn't just that I was interested in doing it, it was that to reach the goals of getting this to the user, I had to do it. We, the, the, without the patent office, <laughs> we wouldn't have gone anywhere. 
So um, I, and, I will also and, say I appreciate tough patent examiners because they will ask the questions that will keep me out of court later. So. That's right. I, I always say it's in your best interest to have a, a very thorough examiner who's going to ask the tough questions. So so thank you for 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 acknowledging that. I'm really interested uh, personally how you learned about the value of of patent protection um, because I I know I'm always comparing. Um, what I knew as a as a you know law student and even an engineering student and what I see is available to law students and engineering students today, I would love to hear how you learned the value of, of patent protection and IP in general. Oh, that's a multifaceted answer. And it's certainly something that developed over years. Um, when I first went to the Naval Research Lab, um, we certainly appreciated that having a patent was important for commercialization of the inventions. So there was a definite interest there. We also had a very good team of patent attorneys on site that would work closely with us to on the process. However, simultaneously, um, in 1987, my husband went into business for himself, and part of that was helping companies defend their patents against infringement um, in the areas that he was familiar with. So through him, I became much more aware of the complexities of the prosecution process and uh, the litigation process, and um, again, became very um, very careful in the way I wrote patent applications to try to stay out of court. But um, in, then further, uh, to make this story even more complex, uh, even before my daughter graduated from college, she took the test to be a patent ex uh, agent and then went to law school. And she's a biotech patent attorney who does prose patent prosecution. Um, she went to NIH for a summer and decided she did not want to be a lab. But if she became a patent attorney, people would pay her to learn science all day long and she'd never have to do it. <laughs> so she was my go-to person every time I had a question about um, how to do a certain thing uh, properly from a patent um, prosecution point of view. And she taught me a great deal. So I've had, uh, so patents have been grew into something of a family affair at my house. That's great. And I have to say that was completely, um, th that answer was completely unexpected uh, uh, because I, I assumed you were going to talk about learning it through work, but it's really interesting that, that your family is, is so involved in, in good, in good fortune uh, to all of you. But I have to now ask a follow on question. You, you talked about writing patent applications yourself. How much of patent prosecution did you do yourself? Um, generally, I learned to write the spec uh, and try to um, make sure it included everything I could think of that it needed to include, plus every, things I couldn't. Like I said, we had very good um, patent attorneys at the Naval Research Lab who really helped us with that. I also learned I cannot write claims. That is just too big a jump leap in the art. So I need a lawyer to write the claims, <laughs> but um, then I can match them up and make sure everything's in the spec and the claims cover the territory that I really intend to be covered, but I cannot write them. <laughs> right. Well, it sounds like you're, you've been very involved, which I know has, has certainly had to have been a help to the attorneys and, and to, the, to the inventions. That's, that's well, absolutely Now I'm trying to teach other faculty members how to do that, too. <laughs> No, that's, had that's some interesting great. experience in that regard at, in North Carolina. That's great. I think that's wonderful that you're you're teaching not only on the on the science but also the patent part. And uh, uh, again, it's absolutely wonderful. Let me um, ask a question about um, success and failure. So, so you shared some of your successes, um, some of uh, your innovations that you're most proud of. Uh, I'd like to ask you about any failures that you ran into during the course of either invention or prosecution, what, however you'd like to take the answer. And I will say that I ask this question because I know that as I meet innovators and inventors, they're always talking about failure and not being afraid to fail and how that's just a part of what they do. And it's just something that, that has resonated with me over the years. So I'd love to hear if you have any stories of, 
of failure? Well, in terms of developing the technology or proving out an idea, there are probably 10 times as many failures as successes. Um, my answer to dealing with that was to surround myself with people who were smarter than I was at every possible opportunity and to establish a culture where no idea is created good. They all have to be punched into shape and everybody gets a crack at it. Um, also, the, uh, the philosophy that um, there's only, if you have one great idea, you shouldn't worry too much about being too protective or holding it too close because you still need all your colleagues to punch at it and create an idea that's really workable and will fly. And if you're smart enough to have, or creative enough to have one good idea, you'll have more. So um, that kind of culture, I worked very hard to establish and it moderated a lot of the failures. I would also uh, gave up the idea that I could overcome all the failures, I would bring in people who knew things that I didn't know um, to help me find ways around the failures, to overcome on workarounds, uh, new ideas, uh, who would think differently than I did. And that generally worked pretty well, not always, but generally pretty well, as long as we both had the same eventual goal in mind. The biggest failures, I would say, have been um, our inability to market our ideas, to find corporate partners, or to help our corporate partners get to where they need to go. Um, we've had some uh, we've had some biosensors that have gotten EPA or FDA approval, and then the company went belly up um, for reasons that had nothing to do with the sensor. And so, you know, the the patent runs out, and nobody's interested anymore. So those are failures. It's kind of like um, having a kid and he goes to elementary school and you help him through high school and they go off to college and become adults and you have no more control at that point. Um, so that's that's been a little frustrating. Uh, the other, I guess one other failure that I had was not being able to convince NRL to file a patent on one of our inventions that worked really well. It was a strip test for de detecting heavy metals. We showed we could detect heavy metals upstream in the Potomac River from the water filtration plant, much to our dismay. Um, but they didn't file the patent. And then when they realized the commercial value that was lost and the value to people that was lost, they completely changed how they evaluated whether or not they would file a patent on a particular invention. But for me, that was a failure of my ability to convey a real sense of the value of the patent or a potential patent. Um, and that was definitely a failure. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, I hear that story, unfortunately somewhat frequently where, where people didn't recognize the, the value of, of, getting a patent and by the time they do it, it it's too late. Um, as a follow-up question to, to the failure issue, um, were any of these failures early in your career? And, and if so, how come they didn't deter you at that point? I understand after you've been very successful, a failure here and there might not be a big deal, but it's when you're newer in your career, it's much harder to accept that. Well, the first, 10 years of my career after leaving graduate school, I worked in science. Um, I was working in uh, biochemistry and immunology, basic and clinical immunology, first in, a med in medical schools in Texas and then at DuPont. And so the whole focus was on learning how things are, not creating inventions per se. So um, if we had a failure, it was because the experiment didn't work. It wasn't because we were trying to create something that didn't work. It was trying to find the right knowledge, not create new things. So um, it wasn't really till I came to the Naval Research Lab that I became very much involved in the engineering and the innovative process of creating patentable um, inventions. Um, and so by then I was already mid-career and uh, getting ornery. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, you've told me uh, relatively recently about a famous invention you had that, that didn't work. Can you share? I, I thought it was a great story. I'd love for others to hear it. Okay, so this is the moral of this story is good ideas can come from anywhere. Um, I had about 15 years ago an idea that I thought would make millions of dollars and uh, just be wonderful for everyone who loves chocolate. And I had been working with uh, material from shrimp shells called chitosan and making these very thin, beautiful films of chitosan that were iridescent blue, like butterfly wings. And so I also learned that chitosan has the property that it absorbs fat. You can buy it in the uh, health food store uh, in a pill form to absorb fat in the gut. Okay, so my idea was that if I could make these beautiful iridescent films and put them on M&Ms, you could eat all of the chocolate you ever wanted and you'd never get fat. So I just thought this was a marvelous idea for those of us who are chocolate lovers. I had boxes of M&Ms in my lab trying to make this work. And so I went, I was at camp convention talking to a bunch of seven-year-olds about four or five years ago. And one of them asked me, what was your favorite invention? And I said, one that didn't work. Try not to tell them more than they want. But another one asked, well, why didn't it work? And I told him about the films and the chitosan. And I said, but the problem is to you have to dissolve that chitosan in acid to make the films. And when you put the M&M in acid, it dissolves too. And so these seven-year-olds thought about it for a minute, and one little boy raises his hand, and he says, why didn't you freeze the M&Ms first? <laughs> that would have worked perfectly. Why didn't we think of that? And another little seven-year-old raises his hand and says, yeah, you can use that smoke, real cold, smoky stuff. And I said, you mean liquid nitrogen? He said, yeah, that's it. So where were they? I needed seven-year-olds in my lab. You know, we, we would have had a, a royalties that would have funded camp invention for the next 10 years. That's a great story. That's a wonderful story and the value of teaming with diverse That's perspectives. Right. Can you, you mentioned camp invention a few times. Um, I'm familiar with camp invention, but I'm sure a lot of uh, folks who are listening in are, are not sure. Would you mind giving a little bit of background about what camp invention is and what your involvement um, is? My pleasure. Camp invention is the signature program of the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And up until the pandemic, there were 200,000 kids going to week-long camp inventions, uh, usually in elementary schools all over the country. And they were just starting to have some in Canada as well. And they have these marvelous programs uh, that are run by teachers and junior high school kids for elementary school kids that challenge the children to be inventors. They give them these fascinating themes and some amazing technology uh, in a format that they can handle um, and challenge them to be inventors. And they learn about the inventive process. Some of them have even learned about patent licensing and so on. Um, but they, my, my role is they have inventors come in um, for a day of the camp if they can, uh, if they if can do that. And so I go and my husband goes and, um, to several every year and just sit there and talk to the kids and let them tell us about their inventions and their ideas and how they came up with them and why they think they're good ideas and how they work together in teams. And it's, a, it's an absolutely amazing program. Last year, they turned it to a virtual program where they would ship boxes of kits and I had some shipped to me for my grandchildren for a grandma camp. And we had robots all running all around the living room. And uh, we were flying little planes outdoors and learning about lift and all kinds of interesting things. Um, I think this coming year, it's going to be a hybrid program. So the, some schools are having it in person. And there will still be the, the um, virtual camp as well. And, and hopefully the following year, it'll all be back in person again. Well, it's an amazing program. If you have friends with elementary school uh, kids, 
certainly encourage them to participate. It is. It is. I will second those words. It is absolutely an amazing program. And in part, it's amazing because of the in, the Hall of Fame inventors like yourself who are paying it forward and, and continuing to help educate the children. So um, I know on behalf of the whole IP community, I will say thank you to you for, for that because I think that's absolutely wonderful. Um, this is a great opportunity to talk about mentoring. Uh, you talked about helping uh, the kids and the camp invention and, and sharing you know, your thoughts with them. Obviously, as a professor, you're, you're dealing with a, a great number of students. Um, can you share some of your thoughts about the importance of mentoring and maybe your, your, your most enjoyable mentoring experience where you've mentored others? In terms of mentoring for inventorship, um, I think for me, the most enjoy enjoyable part is doing it one on one and helping to put people to realize um, what part of their what they're doing might uh, constitute a patentable invention and how to evaluate whether or not it should be patented or published or um, how they should take it the next level on. Um, so that that I really enjoy, and I certainly um, participated with undergraduates as well as graduate students, postdocs, and faculty in that regard. Um, with faculty, part of it's understanding the rules of what really constitutes an inventor and how it's different from being an author on a paper. It's quite different. Um, but so I've enjoyed that. Um, I guess. I've also enjoyed working with some of the people in our tech transfer office. Uh, we've talked about a lot about how to um, democratize the patent or the invention process, if you like. Kelly Sexton and I did a study on patent or in patent inventors at NC State about a year before the patent office did a very similar study and with almost identical results, saying there were very few. Um, female faculty members. There were some female students, but very few faculty members on the inventions and trying to figure out why. Uh, the reasons we came up with were um, they women in engineering were not as successful in getting grants as men, and so they didn't have the, the research base to work from. Uh, the second is uh, women may be more ready to give credit for their ideas to the male PI rather than um, stand up for themselves in terms of uh, saying I deserve a place on this patent because claim number six was my idea. Um, but the real important observation we made was that it's probably a matter of education in terms of why you want to file a patent in the first place. So the patent is process is not solely just geared for a commercial success and profit. That's, that's one reason and companies have to make a profit in order to stay in business, but it's not the only reason by any stretch of the imagination. If you want to get, as I did, your invention into the hands of somebody who needs it to make decisions for their lives that are important, then a patent gives you a hook to get a commercial body interested in making it and, and have the resources allocated to uh, get make the, the jump from the invention to the user. If more women and minorities in particular I think who are focused more on helping people than making money appreciated the, that rationale, that motivation. Uh, I think we would have more of them uh, interested in making um, uh, filing patents. And I certainly see it in our undergraduate teams that are generally 50-50 men and women. They are very interested in the patent process. So I think it's, it's starting to trickle up. And I think we're going to see a lot of a lot more um, diversity in the kinds of inventors. The other the other thing we found kind of by accident, or I discovered talking to the patent office, is that 
Um, a lot of times the patent office or in a university will judge whether or not to file a patent based, based on their evaluation of the market. Many of these have market teams who are entrepreneurs or industry people come in. If those to evaluate the ideas, if all of those people on the team are men and they are all from sort of traditional industries, a woman's idea that is targeted towards a domestic or a female oriented market doesn't get very far. But if you have a bunch of female VCs, for instance, that's sitting there, you're going to get much more positive response to the ideas. So some of it is a matter of uh, changing the culture of who's making the decisions on what gets patented in the first place. Thank you. Those are, are extremely um, insightful, insightful words. And I know, Fran, you are well aware that we at the USPTO um, based on our study of showing about 12% of patents have women on them, which is way too low. Um, and we are we have a whole um, national council um, that working on a strategy for the US to how to enhance access to innovation for women in all underrepresented groups. Um, so this is a very important topic to us. D did you personally in your career run into any roadblocks because you're a female? I mean, I you're sharing all these things that I know you're seeing, but did you live them yourself as well? In my career, absolutely. As an inventor, no. Uh, as I said, I really didn't start doing the invention until I was mid-career and used to dealing and being a, a small percent of the population <laughs> uh, so that it didn't really phase me. At the beginning of my career, I suffered a lot of discrimination because I was female. Much of it will be illegal now, fortunately. Um, but uh, I still like guys, so it's fine. <laughs> Well, it's people like you who are going to help us work through all of these issues jointly as a as a society. Um, I, I'd I think like they're to, getting used to having us around. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'd love to to ask you um, uh, some questions about advice, right? Um, if if you don't mind, and and I've got I guess a few different avenues I, I want to think about here. I want I want you to think about here. Let me start with the first one. If if you can go. Uh, back in time and give yourself advice on the front end of your career, what would today's Fran talk to budding inventor Fran and what advice would you give yourself? I would have learned something more about engineering sooner. So I started out in science because I wanted to help people and particularly medically oriented science appealed to me. Um, and I thought I could have a higher impact being involved in, you know, putting my bricks in the wall of scientific progress uh, by being a scientist than for me going into medicine or something like that. So I went the science route. What I and for much of that, um, the people who were put on the pedestal in science were those that invented new theories. And then the rest of us just proved that they worked the, or didn't work. Um, I like the engineering aspect of creating things that didn't exist before uh, to employing the science and um, then generating a new solution to an important problem. Um, so I would say learn to combine both science and engineering mindsets, I would tell myself. Uh, it's very rewarding to be able to work with in both fields and work on hard problems. So I started out working on problems as most say postdocs and young faculty do that were originally defined by my professors. Um, and I would say evaluate, I would tell myself to evaluate the problems I was working on much more critically and focus on the hardest ones. Okay, great. And so, get the smartest people you can to help you do that. Always good to have the smartest people around you. So I know you're obviously dealing with, with university age people um, in, your, in your teaching. If you could go younger in times, maybe to high school age, um, not yourself here, but what advice would you give to 
high schoolers today who are considering, um, you know, whether invention and entrepreneurship is for them? I would say don't make up your mind yet. Um, I think it's a big mistake to make too many career decisions too fast. I would say do what you think is fun. Do what um, you get excited about. If you get excited about creating something new that might be an invention, then find somebody to help you and go with it. If you, but explore all kinds of things. Uh, don't limit yourself. Um, one thing that's much more clear now than it was when I went to school is that you do you no longer choose a career and spend the rest of your life working in that area. Most people change careers three, four times uh, during their working lifetime. And I certainly changed gears every five and started something entirely new at least every five years, even without changing jobs. Um, and I think that's not unusual. And if you look at people who've been very successful, very few of them are doing what they were doing 20 years ago. So I would say learn everything you can about everything that interests you. Nothing you learn is ever lost. I do an organic synthesis once every 17 or 18 years, whether I need to or not. <laughs> so, you know, just uh, don't limit yourself. Don't make too many hard binding decisions. Uh, go with your, your instincts about what's fun, interesting, and carry on from there. And uh, don't recognize the limits when people try to limit you. That's all, all absolutely wonderful advice. My next question, this will be my final one uh, about advice, and you touched on a little, a little bit of this before. Um, I mentioned the National Council for Expanding Access to Innovation that we're working on. That's, of course, the national strategy for um, fostering innovation at, at all, uh, among all people, and, and certainly uh, with a focus on underrepresented groups. Um, we are currently working on that strategy, and I would love to hear what advice you have for us, you know, for, for the strategy. What, would, what, what can you tell us we should be focused on in this strategy? I doubt I'll come up with anything you haven't already thought about. Um, I think accessibility is the biggest barrier to make it uh, the process and the priorities as transparent as they possibly can be um, at the level of, you know, it can become a household word or a fourth grader can understand it. Um, you know, obviously you're going to have different complexities for people at different levels, but uh, to make it easy and not, not a mystery. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go back to a, a mentoring question. Um, I, I started to go. I had one more mentoring question that I that I that I wanted to ask you, and then uh, the conversation led us to a, a different path. So let me re return to that. But in your um, lifetime, who was the most important person who gave you advice and and really set you on, on the right path? With respect to invention, or in general, it could be either one. That's hard because I've had so many great mentors all the way along. I mean, my uh, certainly my parents were a big influence. My mother was always creating new things, uh, whether it was a flower arrangement or whatever, as was my dad was always building something in the basement. Uh, but as far as one of the reasons I went into science, I became fascinated with biology when we'd go fishing. Yeah, we'd catch a fish and he would you know, open it up. He grew up fishing and hunting to keep his family fed. Um, but he would tell me all the places, this is a female because here's the eggs. And we'd open the stomach. Oh, this one had a cricket for lunch. And this is the gills. And this is how it gets oxygen from the water. And I was always so impressed with how organized everything was in this fish um, and, and other animals too. And so the, the fact that there was this organ, higher level organization to biology that uh, totally fascinated me. And then as I got into school, uh, when I went an undergraduate, I worked at Oak Ridge and isolating the molecule that controls growth in fish. And I guess it was my first engineering lesson. We needed a way to test for the this factor in the water. So we 
took platinum wires and made uh, little fish hooks into the side of a goldfish and made a goldfish electrocardiogram to study the heart rate of a goldfish. Um, so, you know, it's how do you how do you get around these uh, practical problems and make things work? And that paper actually got published and it's still getting citations. <laughs> um, but the so that, that started my fascination with research per se started as an undergraduate. And then uh, as a graduate student, I had a mentor who would talk about science in the morning and the afternoon coffee would be Romanian architecture or anything else in life that uh, seemed interesting at the time to him. Uh, so it, it brought in the social aspects of doing research and his connections all over the world and how important uh, those really are for doing science um, and, and understanding people from different places. So, you know, it's it's definitely been an evolution. Uh, the, you know, I could go on and on. I had great mentors as a postdoctoral fellow in Ellen Vitetta and Jonathan Orr, and um, who are incredibly well-known immunologists now. Uh, one of the people on the bench next to me won a Nobel Prize, uh, Linda Buck. So it was a, a fantastic lab to work in. Um, and, you know, it's just that that kind of thing has continued all my life. There's always been somebody who's challenged me to do something different and uh, something that would make a difference. Um, yep. Life is too short to work for a schmuck. You might as well pick somebody good <laughs> or move on. <laughs> That's great. I, I absolutely love the the fist story. I love all the stories, but the the I have a visual of of you as a as a child thinking about the fish. I think that's absolutely wonderful how that how that set you on a. On I a think course. my kids were kind of grossed out. I did the same thing for that. <laughs> well, um, you know, maybe you planted the same seeds that that set you on the path. But um, but that, my that, son's a physician, a, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it did. Um, uh, just a, a few more questions here. Um, National Inventors Hall of Fame. So uh, obviously uh, we talked about your your induction into the Hall of Fame. Uh, what does what does that mean to you? I mean, what what when you found out you were going to be um, inducted? What was your reaction? Disbelief, <laughs> total disbelief. So the the two other people from the naval associated with the naval had been inducted before me were Thomas Edison and the person who was one of the co-inventors of GPS. And so I'm, uh, how did I get there? But one of my colleagues put it into perfect perspective. He was looking at the people who were inducted in the same year. And one of the historical inductees was the inventor of drywall. And he says, Fran, next to drywall, you're just chopped liver. <laughs> so, um, it was, I was just absolutely amazed, totally terrified <laughs> um, to be in that group. Um, uh, but it has been a wonderful experience uh, getting to know some of the other people who are involved, not only as inductees, but in that organization and the support from the patent office and what they do is just, uh, I'm so happy to be part of it. Very yes, happy to be part and 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 that makes two of us from from my personal perspective and the USPTO. Um, we and I are thrilled to be involved with the National Inventors Hall of Fame, and 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 Fran and I are actually both on on help with the selection committee. So we know now how how hard it is for any inventors like Fran to be inducted. So quite a, a wonderful accomplishment. Um, I'm going to go back to. Um, uh, your, your farm, if you don't mind, and and maybe ask some personal questions about um, your your interests. So, uh, what did you love most about growing up on your grandfather's farm? Well, it was certainly uh, just t getting on the horse and taking off for the day. We packed the saddlebags with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a fishing line and fishing hooks, and come back in time for dinner. Um, just the freedom and the time to explore the woods and enjoy the wildlife and, uh, you know, just be with animals. Uh, when the farmer wasn't looking, we'd chase cows or uh, <laughs> go swimming in the pond <laughs> on horseback. <laughs> uh, just that kind of freedom um, 
to be out in the woods alone all day long or with, you know, with a friend or a, a, my sister sometimes. It's just an amazing way to grow up. And uh, I'm certainly fortunate to be able to have had that experience. And you, 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 I know you still ride today. Um, and, and even so we, we had a session to get ready for this, make sure all the IT worked, et cetera. And you were leaving to go on a ride. Can you share share with everybody about that ride? Uh, we went out, uh, some friends of mine went out uh, just as the sun was going down and the moon was coming up and had a moon, uh, started off in the daylight and finished up in the moonlight. But we got to see it. at the same time, the sun setting and this big pink moon coming up over the horizon uh, in the, from the middle of a, a field. Um, so it was absolutely just beautiful. Um, cool in the evening with the birds singing and and this the this beautiful scenery and just being outside and uh, away from everything else and enjoying this beautiful view. Um, it's uh, just that kind of experience. I love being out on horseback, away from the phone, away from anything. My desk, <laughs> uh, just where there's nothing but you and the horse and nature. It's very special. And so I do do a lot of long distance racing competitions as well, just because it's an excuse to be out for eight hours at a time. So the more the better. What, what, what are the things that you think about when you're on a long distance ride? And I'm not talking about a race, because obviously in a race you're thinking about the race, but when you go out say on this past Tuesday for this moonlight light ride that you were talking about, what are the type of things that, that that you're processing well, in your mind. You're always looking at the wildlife. So the birds that we saw herons, we saw some water snakes. Um, we were hoping to hear some coyotes, but uh, had to make our own howls. Uh, didn't have, didn't hear any this time. I have uh, actually on a race at Biltmore, I saw a mountain lion cross the trail in front of me once. We've seen some amazing wildlife and I thoroughly enjoy that. Uh, I've also very interested in the different kinds of trees that you see and different kinds of vegetation. And no matter how many times I go over the same trail, um, it looks different every time. Um, there's always something different to see out in the woods. So uh, it's, it's a sense of peace and enjoyment for me. Do you ever find yourself um, thinking about work and solving problems while you're riding a horse or are you able to decompartmentalize those completely? Um, I might for the first 20 or 30 minutes after that. No. <laughs> Good for you. I used, to, I used to spend the time, the commuting time back and forth to work, solving those problems and planning the next day's work. I, I can do it driving a car. I can't do it very long for a horse because the horse will realize that you're not paying attention to him and make sure that you pay attention all of a sudden. At least mine will. <laughs> Fair point. So can that that's that's great. Can you talk about um, the the competitions? So you, you talked about um, I wrote it down here, long distance um, competition. What what is that, and and what you know what does that entail? Well, most of the ones that I do are fifty mile races. I've done a couple of hundred mile races, but that's really too long for me. And my horse, I've always had a day job, so I really haven't been able to train for that kind of distance. Um, in 2019, we were in the top 10, and my horse and I were in the top 10 in the country for the 50 mile distance. Um, and then the pandemic hit and I haven't raced since, but uh, the two of us get out there and it is an amazing partnership. Um, there's a lot of communication back and forth. It's my job to make sure he doesn't go too fast at the beginning so that he has enough gas in the tank left at the end. Uh, and it's his job to get me to the end. Um, but we take care of each other and, you know, he really depends on me as much as I depend on him. And it's quite a, it's a very well understood partnership by the time you've done it a few times. And uh, always interesting for the other people you meet and ride with on any particular ride, which, you know, they vary. Uh, so you get to know other people from totally with totally different careers and lifestyles, and, but with a common uh, appreciation of horses and uh, endurance uh, events, I guess, uh, challenging yourself and your horse. And 
quite frankly, my horse loves it. It's his chance to get out and run with the ponies, and he just thinks it's his freedom, and it's wonderful. It's quite fascinating to me, um, and I'm sure to the the hundreds and hundreds of people uh, listening in, that how accomplished you seem to be in everything that that you touch. It's it's, it's really oh, quite no. remarkable. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've tried almost every other sport and I can play at them, but I'm not good at any of them. Well, I was, uh, I almost went, went there with a question and, and, and maybe I will. I know we're, we're, we're running short on time, but I have to ask, how long does it take to do a 50 mile endurance ride on a horse? On average, about eight hours of riding, uh, seven or eight. It depends on the weather, how hot or cold and whether it's flat or in the mountains. So I have done one that was flat and cold in four hours and 17 minutes. I was so exhausted, I got off and passed out, but <laughs> it was fast. Um, and I've taken as long as 12 hours, which is the maximum time allowed. And did you do you, did you do this as a as a child or a teenager, or is this purely as an adult something that? You as an adult, my daughter and I started doing competitive trail riding when she was in high school, and we'd go off. Neither of us had a clue what we were doing, so we were partners instead of mother daughter. And then when she went off to right before she went off to college, we did our first endurance race, which I think was twenty five miles at that point, and. I enjoyed it so much, I kept doing it after she went off to college. Um, and I've been doing it ever since. And That's it's really helped, though, that my husband has uh, become a wonderful pit crew. So he comes along and supports us and takes care of uh, me and the horse. The horses love him because he feeds them and never rides them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that's great, and and we'll just we'll, we'll we'll wrap up here. But I know a lot of people are probably wondering this very simple question: um, How many kids and grandchildren do you have? So I have two kids: um, the phys physician and Charlotte, who's married with three kids, and my daughter, who's the patent attorney in Bethesda, and she has four. So I have seven grandchildren from the ages of three to twelve. That's fantastic. And we have Grandma Camp Invention every other year. All right, that sounds sounds like they're they're very very fortunate uh, grandchildren there, both from the parents and to have the the grandma camp invention. They are all creative, for sure. Well, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much. It's uh, it's it's interesting. I, I've known you for years, and I've learned a great deal in this uh, discussion. And thank you so much for for doing this event with us. And um, we. Uh, you know, I believe part of our outreach and education, um, whether it's through the National Council that I talked about or otherwise, is really having role models and, and people who have been through uh, the challenges of, of innovation and patenting. And I cannot think of a better role model than you. Um, so thank you so much for, for, for that and everything that you do. And um, I, can, I can give you a last opportunity. Is there anything you'd like to share with us? Sorry, just putting you on the spot here, but if there's anything you'd like to share with us before we wrap up, and then we'll go right back to Sean. I would, well, since this is hosted by the patent office, I'll put in a plug for inventors um, to work with their patent examiners to get the best possible outcome that they can. This is not an adversarial relationship. Uh, it is working together, and if they can be uh, bring up any possible weaknesses in your patent, they're your best friends. So you get the right to try to tell them why they're wrong or to work around it, um, but work together on it. And I guess that would be my parting shot there on behalf of inventors and the patent office and future relationships. Great. Thank you very much. Wonderful advice. And again, thank you for, for this session. Um, and I know you're also meeting with some others after this at PTO. So thank you for that as well. Uh, with that, we will wrap up the fireside portion and I'll pass back to Sean. Thank you, Drew, for leading today's discussion. And Fran, thank you for providing us with insight, inspiration, and all of your experience. I also want to thank all of our virtual attendees for spending time with us today. And if you have time, you can join us today at 3 p.m. for another virtual program. Do you know at the USPTO, celebrating National Adventures Month with USPTO historian Adam Bisno. 
Attendees will learn about the role of a federal agency historian, good sources of invention and innovation, as well as USPTO history, aspects of USPTO history being researched and documented right now, what to do if you find historic patent or trademark materials in a family collection. So if you have time today, join us at 3 p.m. Also, plan now to attend our annual conference, InventionCon, being held virtually August 18th through 20th. You can learn about resources and services for inventors and entrepreneurs, learn from other inventors and subject matter experts about best practices for obtaining your protection of your creative work and intellectual property and moving into commercialization. For links to more information about how to register for upcoming programs, please visit our events page at uspto.gov forward slash events. While you're on the events page, I encourage you to check out the many virtual intellectual property education and awareness programs that are available to you for your viewing privilege and pleasure at no cost. You'll be receiving a short survey for today's program. We ask that you please complete it. We value your feedback. Your import is important in creating future programs to meet the needs of our customers. Thank you again for attending today's program, and we look forward to you joining us in the future.